scholars and historians mark the era spanning two centuries from the 1330s to the 1530s as the period of rebirth of European civilization. It was a rebirth from the disorder and conflict of the semi-barbaric Middle Ages, marked by oppressive feudalism, the bigotry of the church, the prolonged crusade of the cross against the crescent, and the competition for power and supremacy between the Holy Roman Empire and the Pope. One of the most significant movements in European history was the Renaissance because it affected a change in man's attitude towards the problem of his existence. I have already mentioned the period which is traditionally believed to be the period of the Renaissance, that is the 1330s to the 1530s. And the Renaissance is visualized in two ways. One is the revival of ancient learning and it spread through traditional methods. The other is a period of innovation in which new knowledge was generated that would form the foundation of modern thought and which would be spread by a new medium that is print, which meant a far wider community would be a part of the debate and the changes associated with the Renaissance. The printing press invented by Gutenberg in the early 15th century was instrumental in spreading literacy. The common man began to read books and think for himself. As students of history, we all know that the Renaissance first occurred in Italy. The question is why in Italy? Why not the rest of Europe but Italy? For this, we have to turn our attention to the period, say the 10th century to the 13th century. The rivalries between the German Holy Roman Empire and the papacy at Italy saw to it that a unified national state did not come into existence in Italy. In its place, we have the independent city-states. Medieval Italy was a land of cities. The urban imprint of the Roman times had never totally erased during some 500 years of barbarian invasion and settlement. It began to reassert itself in the 10th century. New towns came up and old ones were newly revived, brimming with new energy. These cities became independent states, dominated by the bourgeois and the merchant bankers, who had amassed wealth through a vibrant trade with Asia. The thoughts of this new class turned from religion to more worldly things. We know that it in Italy, for the first time, banking and merchant capital became very important. And these bankers and merchants, in collusion with the nobility, formed popular governments of the patricians. And we have based on, I won't say universal suffrage, based on a widespread suffrage, but you will see that most of these governments were confined to the aristocratic classes, to the traders, and to the merchant classes. It's not that these independent city-states were governments of the people and by the people. It was not very democratic as we visualize democratic governments today, but nonetheless, it was a people's popular government, though the leadership was given or the government was formed by a particular section of society. Elsewhere in Europe, the structure was very feudal. So that is why Italy proved to be the hotbed of Renaissance ideas. The Renaissance was the age of art and learning. Aided by the marina's compass, 
It was also the era of adventure and discovery. Christopher Columbus discovered the new world in 1492. Copernicus refuted Ptolemy's geocentric universe in the year 1500. How did the crusade affect the Renaissance? In AD 1095, the Pope and his church council had declared a holy war against Islam for the recovery of the city of Jerusalem. This prolonged war is called the Crusade. For the first time we find that Italy was used as a point of transshipment and the carrying of goods from the other part of Europe into what is called the Holy Land. And this, in fact, led to uh, a contact with the Holy Land. You have uh, Eastern knowledge, Eastern art, and the wealth of the East, the people of Italy being acquainted with that. So, and this wealth of the East, which the rest of Europe did not know about, there was this urge to acquire that wealth by the Italians. In the words of a historian, the Crusades were the military and religious aspects of a general surge towards the East on the part of the reviving energies of Europe. The trade with the Islamic civilization, you were talking about the Crusades, and the Byzantine brought wealth and ideas to Italy. This, these were instrumental in generating new ideas in Italy, which eventually led to this tremendous outpouring of artistic and intellectual um, energy that one associates with the Renaissance. We will see that the first uh, independent city-states that came into existence were Padua, Siena and Florence. In fact, if you look at the Renaissance, the first state in Italy which witnessed the Renaissance was Florence. Florence again, then you'll see why Florence took the first Florence. initiative. Why is it that in Florence you had the Renaissance first? And there you see that uh, the princely house of the Medicis, they patronized art, they patronized culture, they patronized the various artists, they patronized, uh, patronized the various literary figures. And that is why Florence was the first city in Italy to witness what we know as the Renaissance. Was the Renaissance movement mainly confined in the period between 1330 and 1530? If the Renaissance implies change, that change can be traced back to the medieval times. It is an evolutionary process and just one epoch cannot be earmarked as the period of the Renaissance. which. It has been traditional interpretation was that, but this has been refuted by many historians and they say that you cannot talk about one particular period as being the period of the Renaissance. Though of course this was the period which witnessed tremendous, as I keep telling you, tremendous outpouring of intellectual and artistic ideas, yet you cannot confine the Renaissance to this singular era. Can we see the Medici family dominating this, uh, patronizing this type of uh, Italy's uh, architecture, paintings and all? Can we say this was a dominant type of ideas? When we talk about the social roots of the Renaissance, you will see that it is something which did not permeate down to the low echelons of society. It was primarily a very elitist movement. 
if you talk about art if you talk about architecture if you talk about these magnificent palatial buildings and the monuments if you talk about the art of the sistine chapel it did it benefit the commoner mm. if you if you talk about the tremendous efflorescence of art and architecture then you will see that the italian cities vied with each other to prove their uh, predominance by building these very grand and uh, very embellished monuments and of course also patronizing the, these artworks which really didn't did not benefit the common man it's true but uh, nonetheless what any movement or any event in history cannot be thought to be merely influencing just a particular strata of society its effects are bound to permeate down to the lower levels we find that the renaissance flourished because of the patronage of the popes the princes the cardinals and the merchants so it was in fact if or the scope of the renaissance was very aristocratic and it offered economic intellectual and political opportunities only to a very small group of people so i think that answers your question the aristocratic structure of the society was never submerged by the growth of the merchant class though the merchant class wanted to elevate themselves to the position of the aristocracy and that is why they promoted civility and uh, they tried to widen the horizons of aristocratic life it is the endeavor from their side or the they were trying to elevate their social status but the nobility was in no mood to accept their elevated status at the beginning eventually they had to work in collusion with the merchant classes because this was the class who had the money the renaissance expanded man's consciousness so that he now aspired to be elegant eloquent good mannered and accomplished in numerous respects as well as to be a good christian so as we talk about the renaissance the general idea is it's a very secular movement okay but religion was never outside the ambit of the renaissance if you look at uh, the various um, the pietas the crucifixion the madonnas and the innumerable scenes which were you know painted by the various artists then this becomes very clear that religion was a very integral part of the renaissance they could not uh, totally ignore religion though of course they were talking about the revival of ancient learning though of course we say that there was the revival uh, of paganism though of course we say they were trying to uh, copy or they were trying to sort of relive the past that past which was lived by the greeks and the romans but there were four chief centers of the renaissance of course you start with florence then you have milan rome and eventually venice in fact it was venice which was the last city to witness the renaissance but the renaissance remained there for a much longer time it's not that the renaissance remained confined to italy alone just as it spread from florence to the other italian cities it also spread outside the frontiers of italy but the renaissance did not uh, spread immediately to the countries neighboring italy why because the countries neighboring italy were steeped in feudalism so that is why countries such as say england countries as far as spain were influenced by the renaissance ideals and we find or we see the renaissance uh, occurring in england and spain but not in the immediate vicinity of italy from the time of petrarch we have seen that historians have interpreted and reinterpreted the renaissance 
And we see that the questions that are raised is, can the Renaissance be taken to be a break with the past? Was it a watershed in the history of Europe? Or was it a continuous event? Was it an isolated occurrence? Or did the seeds of the Renaissance, or could the seeds of the Renaissance be traced to an era much before the era that we have spoken about? In fact, we can trace the beginnings of the Renaissance to a much earlier period. Of course, this uh, flocking of various colors into Italy from Constantinople acted as a catalyst, but it was not the sole reason as to why Italy witnessed a Renaissance. Much before the Renaissance that we are talking about, there were so many other Renaissances. What about the Carolingian Renaissance of the 9th century? The Middle Ages had produced at least two earlier revivals of antiquity. The Carolingian Renaissance of the late 8th and 9th centuries saved many ancient works from destruction and oblivion, passing them to posterity in its beautiful and minuscule script. The Carolingian Renaissance for the first time spoke about this revival of Latin writing. And also, it spoke about prose and verse composition. More important than this was the medieval renaissance of the 12th century, which saw the establishment of scholasticism. The system of philosophy that buttressed the control of the church in the realm of scholarship and thought in the Middle Ages. The renaissance period, it, uh, it was a transition. You are saying it is a transition from the medieval period to the modern period yes. is coming. But how means can we say that uh, it overshadowed, I mean the scientific revolution of the 17th century overshadowed the renaissance period? Yes. The scientific revolution in fact has been, you know, has been termed as another yeah. kind of a renaissance, yeah. which brought in a whole plethora of new ideas and there with the, you know, with the scientific revolution coming in, here you start questioning the existence of God. Yeah. Where you're talking about the Renaissance, where you're talking about humanism, you're talking about the importance of man, but at no time you're totally negating the existence of God. Or at no time can you come out of this ambit of Christianity. The scientific revolution was much more secular. Ma'am, was the Renaissance period a revolution or a regression? Means how can we say it that it was a revolution or a regression? If you mean a revolution by something new, hmm. then of course, if you look at the artistic and the uh, intellectual outpouring, it was a step forward. Regression in the sense, if you talk about, um, it did not affect the commoners, the society at large remained outside the ambit of the Renaissance, then it's not actually a regression, it is a limitation. The outpouring of any sort of knowledge cannot be termed a regression. It is a step forward. You can say that it had its limitations and the limitation was it was very aristocratic in nature. Ma'am, during the Renaissance period, do we find any position of uh, the woman? How the was the woman in included in the, the Renaissance? Renaissance? It's a man-centric world. Where is the woman? Mm -hmm. Who talks about the woman? If you look at the various forms, if you look at art, where the woman is concerned, it is the Madonna. Madonna, Madonna. Madonna what is the position of Madonna? And if you look at the Madonna, she is a picture of piety, a, a, a very um, patriarchal society which conceives of the woman in a particular way. It's not the woman's side of the story, but the way the man visualizes the woman. Okay. So what a woman is, or how desirable a woman is, as far as the man is concerned, what is the, um, you know, the actual, the apt woman in the eyes of man? She is the Madonna. She is full of compassion. She is, um, full of that motherly love. That is, she's full of a, a kind of a sensuality. 
something which has been perceived by men. It is not the way women envisage themselves, but the way men see women or the way uh, a, or what is a perfect woman in the eyes of the men. Renaissance um, signal the innovation or it merely a rebirth also? It is not only innovation, it is also a revival. A revival. An innovation which drew inspiration from the ancient world of the Greeks and the Romans. Okay. It innovated new things. It, you know, the if you look at uh, the use of form, where you're talking about um, Christian humanism, or where you're talking about, say, the statue of David. What is it? It's actually drawing from the pagan uh, knowledge of men. We can conclude by quoting what J.M. Thompson has to say about the Renaissance. Let's quote him. He says, let the word be freedom. Freedom from the tyranny of the medieval world order. Freedom of thought from Aristotle as interpreted by Aquinas. Freedom in history from the parochialism and credulity of the monastic chronicler. Freedom in art from the illustrated manuscript and the stained glass window, freedom in literature from the censorship of the church. In politics, freedom from feudalism. In religion, from traditionalism. With a new universe in the sky, a new world in the sea, and a new learning on his study shelf, the 16th century student might well feel that the old age was passing away and that the dawn of the new age was at hand. Mm -hmm.